Uh, Kelly, I think you're on mute, by the way. I sure was. <laughs> <laughs> All good. All good. We are going to let people That's take this, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's 2020. Everybody's still getting used to those technical issues, so it is totally fine. Um, yeah, we are going to let everybody kind of filter in here. Um, I know a lot of people were probably joining our last session with Becca from the Toyota team, so we know um, people are coming straight in from us. Thank you for the, the pumpkin. Um, this was one of our colleagues put some extra time and effort <laughs> to give us a little bit of a nice background um, that we could broadcast from. So, all right. Um, I know a lot of people are still joining us. Um, that is totally fine. Just because we are um, uh, running a little bit behind today, I do wanna keep going and get starting. Uh, just so that we can make the most of our time with Kelly today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, you will notice that Emily just put into the chat the link to the closed captioning link. If you do uh, re uh, request uh, closed captioning, you can go to that link. So um, just as a quick introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Ian Rutledge. I am a customer success manager here at Quorum. Um, it is very exciting to be here with you all today. Uh, today, during our session, we're going to be talking about digital engagement in the public affairs space, something that is incredibly relevant to the world that we are in right now. And I can think of no one better than to have as my guest than our very own Kelly Kenai. Um, Kelly has worked in the communications and advocacy space for over 25 years. Uh, she is currently the Senior Director of Communications and Advocacy Engagement at uh, YMCA of the USA, um, where she leads a team in mobilizing tens and thousands of advocates around different policy issues um, for their specific work and the work that they partner with a number of different nonprofits on. So thank you for being here today, Kelly. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I'm super excited. Of course. Um, no, you were obviously the right person to bring. So if you want to just start out, you know, I know you have had a very kind of robust traditional engagement strategy of, you know, you'll do the things like the fly-ins and meeting with um, staffers and member and public officials on the Hill, all those types of things. But obviously when COVID hit, things changed. Um, we had to look at things in an entirely uh, new way. So how did your team kind of adapt to that? What strategies did you kind of switch to to engage in a digital environment? Sure. So, you know, I guess I would start off just by saying that we started with a lot of the traditional strategies that we had been using, but um, we really just had to kind of amp them up and be even more strategic about how we were using them. I mean, obviously you always wanna be strategic, but you know, we really did um, make sure we were being very thoughtful about, about how we were using them. And you know, in terms of digital advocacy, we started off with launching typical action alert campaigns, um, to the list that we have in Quorum, but we also kind of did double duty to make sure that Y leaders across the country at various levels were also hearing about what we were doing and, and making sure that they were engaged as well. Um, you know, and what was really different about these was their urgency. Um, YMCAs were among the first to close when governors started issuing um, shutdown orders. Um, the lack of program revenue and dues um, and the traditional facility closures just really impacted us and, and just really devastated YMCAs across the country. Um, so, you know, and we were still providing services that people really needed. So we needed to like balance that out. You know, we, we couldn't open our traditional programs and facilities yet our services um, were in more need than they ever had been before. And, you know, as a nonprofit, we needed to try to find a way to, to balance that out. So I feel like, you know, because things were so urgent, we had wise who had to furlough or lay off between 75% and 95% of their staff. So people were really feeling like they were motivated. They wanted to do something. So I really think that that helped to increase the number of people who responded to our action alerts. 
um, our response rates really went up. And I, I think we went from something like 17,000 people in our database to more than 25,000, um, which for us, I mean, that just blew us away. And I think that was within the first, you know, one or two action alerts that we launched. So, um, you know, we've definitely had to clean up the list. We found like a core group that have been really consistently engaged. Obviously not everyone all the time, but um, we've got that core group who are really reliable. Um, you know, we also turned to the Outbox feature, which mm -hmm. we've used a little bit on and off um, previously, but we started to do almost like a series of personal emails from our um, senior VP of government relations directly to chiefs of staff or LDs. Um, and we got really great response from that. We were, you know, I was a little bit surprised, you know, he would get emails back asking more questions or people just, you know, reiterating their support for our priorities. So that was kind of nice for us to see that, you know, those kinds of things weren't just being uh, viewed as spam, but right. um, <laughs> we were actually looking at them and were interested in, in what we had to say. Um, I'd also say that we have been using social media a lot more in our advocacy before it wasn't really something that we were super comfortable doing, but um, we've really amped that up a lot and I've been really pleased with what we've been seeing. Um, and then of course we've turned to virtual meetings just like everyone else has. Um, our government relations team um, would set up meetings with Hill staff to talk about our priorities and rather than just the DC based team going in and visiting someone in their office, they were able to set up those very targeted meetings um, and actually engage constituents. So they could tell their story. You know, th that's the type of thing you really can only do during a fly-in, but this right. virtual environment really allowed us to tell the story from the local level. And it was coming you know, straight from the constituent, not from the DC lobbyist. So, you know, that was really great. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is, um, something that we did in collaboration with our coalition of nonprofits that we work with. Almost from the beginning of the pandemic, um, the nonprofit sector coalesced together and um, it was under a coalition kind of under the banner of relief for charities, hashtag relief for charities. Mm -hmm. um, and we had several work groups. There was a policy work group, a communications work group, a grassroots work group. We were able to coordinate messaging and timing and strategies. And you know, that was really helpful. Um, and I'd say several weeks, maybe even a couple of months down the line, we all um, together launched a week of action, a virtual week of action. So each day there was a different theme. There would be a congressional briefing that day hosted by one of the organizations. And then there would also be social media and grassroots messaging that participating organizations would all lift up during that day and week. So we're really able to elevate our priorities for the nonprofit sector. Um, with one large voice. Um, and I think that was something that I'm, I'm super proud of that we were able to pull off. Um, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the, you know, you you talked about a number of different ways that you engage digitally. And I think that those are all really impressive. I can say from personal experience, just having seen the Relief for Charities kind of conversation on social media, that was really cool um, to see how that conversation had moved into space, I think, that wasn't traditional advocacy space in that you were seeing a lot of people who may not be that kind of government familiar or um, savvy kind of engaging with these advocacy uh, messaging. That's absolutely right. I think we, we've been able to really engage people at all levels. I've always said that I feel like at the Y, our strength has been grass tops. We work very closely, very directly with our state alliance leaders. Every state has a YMCA state alliance and they focus on advocacy and, and those folks are really our go-tos. We also work very closely with YMCA CEOs, COOs, chief volunteer officers. But what we've been trying to do for a really long time is to, con is to engage staff at other levels. So maybe someone who works um, in a childcare center or someone who works in a food program. It's very hard for us to get down to those levels because we don't have direct access to them. We have to rely on the different YMCA association leaders to kind of help that trickle it down. And you know, we do have some internal networks that we try to share through, but I, I think again, because of the urgency of the situation and just the fact that people wanted to feel like they were doing something, everyone felt so helpless. Um, yeah. You know, they felt like they were really contributing to something that, that, that mattered to them personally. 
um, if they had been furloughed or laid off, it was something that they could do to you know, help their why recover. Um, so it really has allowed us to reach all levels of the organization, younger staff, emerging leaders, program staff. Um, I also think it's helped to um, educate people a little bit more about what advocacy is at the Y and why it's important. You know, again, that's people don't always understand how advocacy impacts their day to day. And I think we were able to really help people better understand that through all of this. Um, which again has been, you know, really helpful, and I think will hopefully continue down the line when you know, kind of all this is over. Right. It's kind of using their attention while everything is focused digitally. They're looking at those inbox, those social media feeds, taking advantage of that time to really kind of get in front of them. Yeah, exactly. I feel like you know, there there has been a bit of a silver lining um, to right. the situation that we're all in. So. Yeah. Totally. So, did you have any kind of? Um, expectations around these virtual campaigns or meetings that you were having um, going in uh, that were then kind of turned around or kind of you or were met or weren't met, um, I should say, along the way? I don't know about expectations, maybe. I guess um, one of the things that surprised us a little bit is that we were very worried about advocate fatigue. I mean, there was a time where we were sending out action alerts almost every week, sometimes more than once, which we typically just don't do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, we were very hesitant after a certain point to continue doing that. Or do we need to give people a break? Or, you know, do we need to space these apart? Or, okay, so we did something on this issue, you know, a couple of days ago, is it okay to do something on something else? You know, so we really, um, we really had a, had to think, very carefully about our timing, um, but we were very surprised because we we decided, you know, we're going to move forward. We're going to do it, um, and people responded. And yeah. then when people didn't hear from us for a while. There's a lot of people come back to us and say, "What can we do? What what can we be doing now?" Because unfortunately, you know, we did see some success in the beginning, but you mm -hmm. know, as everyone knows, you know, Congress hasn't exactly been able to come together on another COVID package. Um, and we certainly haven't really seen um, a lot that addressed our priorities um, since the beginning. So we are, um, you know, just hearing from people who, you know, they, they want to see something happen and they want to do something to make that happen. Right. Um, and uh, we actually, so we actually just got a question in our chat asking if you could speak to an example of what an action, what you might send an action alert about in your one of your virtual campaigns, how might that be framed? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, again, over the past several months, we've been focused on relief for charities um, with the nonprofit sector. So our campaigns are focused on the, the four priorities that the nonprofit sector um, have been focusing on all along. Um, <laughs> among them are expanded um, PPP dollars. Um, there are many uh, nonprofits who were not eligible to apply for PPP who still need relief. Um, there are some unemployment insurance issues. Um, a lot of nonprofits are actually self-employed. Um, so uh, partial payments were provided through the CARES Act, but um, there's still a lot of nonprofits who are getting hit with huge, huge bills right now that they hadn't planned for, you know? So that's one other piece of um, our priorities. Um, universal charitable deduction is another priority for us. Um, so we would basically activate our network around those relief for charities priorities. And um, a campaign might look like just a regular email action alert that also had some social media components to it. We want to make sure that we are giving people basically have something for everyone. You know, some people aren't comfortable just doing social media campaigns. Um, some people want to do more than just send an action alert. Um, so we make sure that we give something for everyone. And we'll always have sample tweets or we'll let people create their own. But um, we just want to make it really easy for people. Absolutely. I think lowering those barriers to entry are always going to be key in helping those advocates kind of form those advocacy habits along the way, probably. Yeah. And in fact, you know, I'd say we always get um, a couple of emails after a campaign saying, geez, thanks for making this so easy for us. You know, it takes less than a minute. Right. Right, right, right. 
So you spoke a little bit about how your advocate surprised you and their kind of willingness and um, desire to be even more engaged uh, than expected. Was there any kind of surprises or unexpected behavior in the way that you interacted with public officials, like the meetings that you held? Um, how were those any different than you might usually see when you were doing regular meetings on the Hill in a normal time? Yeah, I mean, I think from what I understand from my colleagues on the government relations side is that they got really great engagement and they actually had more participation from members. Whereas, you know, often members are bouncing back and forth between meetings or, you know, votes, whatever, um, because a lot of them were home or just in the office, they were able to do more. Um, so I think that, again, was something that was really valuable. And again, just bringing those constituents in always makes a difference. Right. So um, I, I think in that, that situation, again, that's another silver lining, right? You just, you, you get yeah. to talk to the boss. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. Um, we got another question from one of our viewers uh, asking, could you talk a little bit more about your week of action? Did you have different audiences for each day of the congressional briefings? Did you advertise the day's theme at all under the umbrella of a week-long effort by day or by theme? Yes, we did. Uh, we did advertise it as a week-long effort. And um, then we would do some targeted promotion. So for example, if the issue was, um, gosh, uh, forgive me for forgetting exactly what the, the briefings were on, but um, you know, if it was universal charitable deduction, you know, we would target one committee. If it was um, unemployment insurance, we would again target staffers from the committee of jurisdiction there. So yes, we did definitely target it um, for each day. Um, but you know, it was in general, it was for Hill staff. Um, and in terms of audience, we would open it up to um, anyone from the nonprofit sector, any of our, our advocacy leaders, both at the federal level in DC and then also back home. Did that, I think that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, Elizabeth had a follow-up question of, were your congressional briefings public for advocates to attend or was it just a one-two punch effort of educating Congress while involving your advocates on social and through email? Yeah, so the answer is yes. I think it was, it was a little bit of both. We did open it up to advocates, but you know, really our goal was to get those staffers on, yeah. on the phone, on, on Zoom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so that was our primary audience. But we did think that it was valuable to educate our advocates in the field as well, because many of them, you know, they're not in the weeds like we are. So it was helpful to be able to, um, to invite them so they could learn more. Mm -hmm. No, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, in terms of kind of moving forward, in terms of next steps, you talked a little bit about how it's kind of been tough hitting a bit of a roadblock in Congress. Um, are there other opportunities out there that you haven't maybe explored yet that you're gonna, that you've been considering in terms of how you keep moving forward in this virtual engagement space? Yeah, I think the next big opportunity for us is a virtual fly-in. Um, our in-person fly-in was probably one of the last big events before COVID hit. Um, it was the first week of March. Um, and we've, we've been experimenting with the virtual advocacy days during our fly-in. So we, we bring in about 300 people, but then of course we invite um, all other Y leaders across the country to participate virtually. Um, with an action alert the day that everyone is up on the hill, we start a week early to try to educate them about what the issues are. And to be honest, I think we've been a little bit underwhelmed by the response, but um, this March, it will be um, an all virtual fly-in. And I think we have a lot of really good opportunities to do some new things, to engage new people. Again, emerging leaders, younger staff across the country, people who can't come to Washington. You know, we have a a limited budget. We really can only have, you know, right now 300 people come to our fly-in, but this way we can have, you know, many more. So I'm excited about targeting um, many more people and just learning really how to use um, the different platforms to engage people in a, in a different way. Um, 
I know at first we were kind of disappointed we weren't going to be able to see everyone in person, but now we're really excited by the opportunities that we have to get more people involved. Absolutely. No, that's definitely an exciting event. I know that we've, um, I remember being at that uh, fly-in, which was really fun um, getting to see you all uh, really engage with a lot of different people. And I think that um, the, like you said, the ability to kind of engage those individuals who never would have had the opportunity, um, they wouldn't have even kind of considered engaging in the advocacy because maybe they think, okay, well, I definitely can't go to DC, so why even engage with advocacy at all? Yeah. Um, and so I think that just kind of because everything's going to be framed differently, it opens a kind of new world of opportunities and how um, those individuals will engage with a kind of uh, together push um, event where you all can kind of push for your policy priorities as a movement. Yeah, and you know, I think it demystifies advocate advocacy a little bit as well. You know, like I think people might be a little intimidated by going into a congressional office. They don't know what to expect. You know, maybe they're a little nervous, but you know, maybe participating in um, a virtual fashion um, helps them to get their, you know, foot in the door, dip their toe in the water, you know, yeah. whatever, and, and, and help them understand that, you know, really, I mean, to me, I always say everyone is an advocate. You know, everyone has a story to tell. Um, maybe you're just telling it to a different person, you know, than you would normally. Um, but, you know, you don't have to be a high powered lobbyist to make a difference, you know, in Congress, you know, you just have to tell your story. And, you know, I, I think yeah. it'll be really interesting to figure out. Absolutely. Well, Kelly, my last question for you today is if you could challenge public affairs professionals to do one thing, what would it be? Um, challenge. So I guess I would say just, you know, challenge your, your assumptions and don't be afraid to maybe break the rules a little bit. You know, like I was saying, we were really afraid of advocate fatigue. Um, but people really wanted to do something. Um, now that might not work all the time, but it, it did in this situation for us. But um, you know, just try new things. Don't don't be afraid. Um, there are so many tools and opportunities and strategies out there, and you know, try them all, even if it's just to a smaller audience. You know, you don't have to do a blast to everyone, but you know, do a pilot here or there, see how it works you know, get feedback maybe from, from some of your key advocates, but, you know, just, just don't be afraid to challenge, you know, what you've done in the past. Absolutely. I think that's a great point. And I think that there's a lot of kind of, as, you know, as you were saying, as much as this situation is very complicated and very hard, and we all want uh, to be out of it as quickly as possible, there is a lot of room for innovation in how we think about our engagement with public officials and advocates along the way. So um, I think that there's a lot of room for that kind of growth in thinking. Um, well, we appreciate everyone's time today. I know that coming up is going to be the talk with how to engage students and Gen Z. Um, so I will wanna make sure that everyone can get to that okay, you are free to head on to that. I did see there was one more question that I'm gonna to pose to Kelly with our last few seconds here. Um, and this is from Corinne, uh, which is how many grassroots advocates are in your network and how do you decide which universe of advocates to target? That's a good question. Um, like I said, I think we had started in back in March with about 17,000 and we're somewhere between 25 and 30. Um, that's where we got to throughout the pandemic and now we've kind of whittled it back to a much smaller number just because there were a lot of people who had maybe only responded to one alert um, but you know we typically will send something to the entire network unless it's very very targeted and specific so we haven't yet um, done profiles for our advocates where they can choose their issues it's something we need to do and we will be working on in the coming months. But until we do that, it's kind of hard to target. Now we'll do that offline. So for example, um, we have early childhood networks, you know, through our, our field. And um, so we're able to send alerts there to make sure that that group of people is seeing those things. Or if it's a health alert, something related to chronic disease prevention, we'll send it through that network too. But um, through actu our actual database, 
we're not targeting exactly probably the best way that we could. So we, that's something we need to work on. Sounds good. I appreciate all your insight today, Kelly. You have been great um, as always. It is so fun to work with you. Um, if anyone has uh, questions, please feel free to pass them along to the quorum team. We can definitely um, try and answer any questions you have about quorum. And then additionally, if there are questions for Kelly, we are happy to pass those along and see if she would be willing to pa pass along the little insight that we can post on the quorum summit page as well. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Kelly, it was good to see you. Bye, guys. Thank you.